Prime Minister Modi steals the show in the East, captivates crowds with a road show in Bhubaneswar. Amit Shah levies serious charges against the CPIM government in Kerala, says more than 120 BJP and RSS workers have died under the Kerala Chief Minister's watch. The battle for Lucknow is heating up. Shatrugan Sinha's wife Poonam will challenge Home Minister Rajnath Singh on a Samajwadi party ticket. BJP workers try to hijack Urmila Matodkar's campaign in Mumbai. The actor turned politician gets police cover after Monday's clash between workers. And Narendra Modi's campaign gets an endorsement from cricketer Ravinder Jadeja. The Prime Minister replies with a thank you. and welcome to India Election Watch. The second phase of polling is two days away and you're watching an all-new episode. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay and this is the only show, may I add, which gives you updates and analysis clear, concise, to the point, without any twists and spins. We wrap up the election day in less than 30 minutes for you. Let's bring you up to speed with the big stories of today. Still early days in this election, but it's crunch time for the candidates in the southern and eastern parts of the country. Campaigning is, in fact, uh, campaigning ended today. Let's bring our rally roster. Campaigning for the second phase were over, was over, but in other parts of the country, the rallies continued. Prime Minister Modi is back on the campaign trail. He was in Chhattisgarh and Odisha. 32 seats up for grabs from these two states. Amit Shah. BJP president not very far away. He was in Karnataka and Kerala. These states sent 48 candidates to the Lok Sabha in all. Rahul Gandhi was also in Kerala. The Congress believes it has a fighting chance here. Kerala is represented by 20 MPs in the Lok Sabha. So phase two of voting kicks off in two days from now. 97 constituencies in the fray across 13 states. The candidates have made their one final push. But the focus remains on southern and eastern India. No one wants to miss out. The BJP wants to make gains here. The Congress feels it has an edge over the Saffron Party. And regional parties believe that they hold sway. The competition is intense. Leaders from all major political parties are crisscrossing these parts of the country, southern and eastern India. Let's start with Rahul Gandhi's campaign. He was in Kerala. He did four rallies there. The Congress has been able to generate some buzz in that state. The Congress president, in addition to Ameti, is contesting from Wayanad in Kerala. But irrespective of the state he goes to, Rahul Gandhi's campaign pitch remains the same. He continues to attack Prime Minister Narendra Modi over Rafal and demonetization. He blames the RSS for dividing India. I normally fight the election from Ameti in North India. But this time I chose to give a message to South India by fighting from Kerala. Because I wanted to give a message that India is not just one perspective. India is just not one idea. India is millions and millions of different viewpoints, different perspectives, and all of those are important to us. Because currently our country is under attack by the BJP and the RSS. Rahul Gandhi's aggression is causing him legal trouble. First, he got a notice from the Supreme Court. Now, he faces potential defamation suit in Patna. The Bihar Deputy Chief Minister, Mr. Sushil Kumar Modi, could file a case in a couple of days. I have said that I will Rahul Gandhi to the Mahan of Rahul Gandhi. My lawyer is ready for it. And in the next one or two days, Rahul Gandhi will be ready for the Mahan of Rahul Gandhi. So, one thing is that the whole thing is the whole thing is the whole thing. तो बिहार में तो पासवान समाज के लोग चौकीदारी करते हैं यानी सारे पासवान चोर हैं फिर कह रहे हैं कि सारे मोदी चोर हैं तो क्या मोदी टाइटल रखना गुना है क्या और मोदी सरनेम वैसे समाज के लोग व्यापार करने वाले लोग बहुत बड़ी संख्या में और अपना टाइटल मोदी रखते हैं तो राहुल गांधी जिस भाषा का प्रयोग कर रहे हैं तो उन्होंने केवल देश के चौकीदारों को चोर नहीं कहा बल्कि मोदी टाइटल रखने वाले इस देश के अंदर करोड़ों लोग जो हैं उनको भी उन्होंने चोर कहा है This seems to be the BJP's new strategy. Contest Rahul Gandhi's claims over Rafal with lawsuits. The BJP has already filed a case of contempt against the Congress president in the Supreme Court. On Monday, the Apex Court asked Rahul Gandhi to explain himself. 
This is also playing out on the campaign trail. The Prime Minister today attacked Mr. Gandhi over his choice of words. He said that the Congress President has insulted a section of the society with his speeches. The Chaukidar versus Chor debate continues. In Namdar, as a lagrai, Galia Deneki, but this is a bit the bad Keneki passion over here. Ononi Abiyak Arop Lagaya. सारे मोदी चोर क्यों हैं? अब यहाँ जो साहू समाज है, अगर वो गुजरात में हो तो उनको लोग मोदी कहते हैं। क्या सब के सब चोर हैं क्या? क्या इनको शोभा देता है क्या? ये भाषा बोली जाती है क्या? Meanwhile, there's a new twist in the battle for Uttar Pradesh. Shatrugan Sinha's wife, Poonam Sinha, joined the Samajwadi party today and she will contest from Lucknow. She will challenge Home Minister Rajnath Singh. The announcement came just after the Union Minister filed his nominations. In fact, uh, Poonam Sinha's husband, Shatrugan Sinha, had an unceremonious exit from the BJP recently. He joined the Congress party and now it seems like his wife too wants to take on the BJP in its bastion of Lucknow. Atal Bihari Vajpayee held the Lucknow seat from 1991 to 2009. After that, Rajnath Singh has represented Lucknow in Parliament. But with the Samajwadi Party joining hands with the BSP in this election, there might be a contest, though most people are still betting their money on Rajnath Singh. The Election Commission has woken up now. That was the reaction of the Supreme Court after the poll watchdog banned four politicians from campaigning. Until yesterday, the poll watchdog described itself as toothless. They said they had no powers. But after the Chief Justice of India pulled them up, the Election Commission, quote-unquote, found its powers today. That's not me. That is what the Commission told the Chief Justice in court. The Election Commission may have woken up, but it remains slow while acting on violations of the model code. Polarizing speeches continue. Sample these latest cases. Congress leader Navjot Singh Sidhu made a communal appeal to Muslim voters. He warned them against voting for regional parties. Listen into what he said. मैं आपको चेतावनी देने आया हूं बहनों भाइयों ये बांट रहे हैं आपको मुस्लिम भाइयों ये यहां पे ओवैसी साहब जैसे लोगों को लाके एक नई पार्टी साथ में खड़ी करके आप लोगों की वोटें बांट के ये जीतना चाहते हैं अगर तुम लोग इकट्ठे हुए 400 प्रतिशत आपकी आबादी है माइनॉरिटी मेजॉरिटी में है यहां पे यदि तुम इकट्ठे हुए और इकट्ठे होके एक जुट होके वोट डाला तो सब उलट जाएंगे मोदी सुलट जाएगा छक्का लग जाएगा He's not alone. Azam Khan's son, Abdullah, has given a religious twist to the case against his father. He has claimed that the election commission punished his father because he was a Muslim. भारतीय जनता पार्टी को खुश करने के लिए आजम खान को बैन करना बहुत जरूरी था क्योंकि योगी आदित्यनाथ साहब को बैन किया था इसलिए ताकि ऐसा न लगे कि भारतीय जनता पार्टी के खिलाफ कोई कार्रवाई कर दी और भारतीय जनता पार्टी के आला नेता नाराज ना हो जाएं इसलिए आजम खान को भी बैन कर दो you do remember what Azam Khan said. Last night, he was banned from campaigning for 72 hours after he made a sexist comment against BJP leader Jaya Prada. But it seems like Azam Khan's son has no fear of the election commission either. So is this election commission truly helpless? Going by their own admission in the Supreme Court, the poll watchdog does have many powers. The precedent is as recent as 2014. In the last general election, Azam Khan and Amit Shah were banned from campaigning altogether. The ban on Amit Shah was lifted after he wrote to the election commission and he promised to respect the model code of conduct. In times of social media where information spreads almost instantaneously, India needs a vigilant, active election commission. It's something that is also the demand of India's Supreme Court now. Now, in less than 48 hours from now, phase two of the Lok Sabha election will begin. As we said, 97 constituencies in 13 states and union territories will vote. What are the key battles, you may ask? Let's start with Tamil Nadu. The battle for Shiva Ganga will be worth watching here. Karthi Chidambaram from the Congress versus H. Raja from the BJP. Let me tell you about both these leaders. Karthi Chidambaram faces serious corruption charges. Shiva Ganga was his father's seat, former union minister P. Chidambaram. In 2014, Karthi Chidambaram contested and he lost. 
Jailalitha's AIDMK bagged the seat. But the constituency has been a Congress bastion traditionally, one of the very few in Tamil Nadu. Now the NDA has its eye on Shivaganga. They fielded H. Raja of the BJP. He is known for making polarizing statements and personal attacks on opponents. He's been controversial. He faces many court cases. He often brands his opponents as anti-Indian. If he defeats Karthi Chidambaram, it will send out a huge message, a death knell perhaps for the Congress in the state. Karthi is counting on anti-incumbency against the BJP and the AIDMK to sail through. Number two on our list is the contest in Dharmapuri, also in Tamil Nadu, one of the few seats where the NDA has a shot at victory. Anbumani Ramados versus Senthil Kumar. Ramados is a former union minister and a PMK leader. He's an ally of the BJP. He has an edge. This region is dominated by the Vanniyar community, which Ramados belongs to. Plus, he's won the constituency twice in the last 15 years. Even when Jailalitha swept the 2014 election, her party could not win this seat, Dharmapuri, one of the two seats where the AIDMK lost the last time. Ramados faces the DMK's Senthil Kumar. And there's a third player in this battle, a BSP candidate. Sivanandam, BSP Mayavati's party, he may split the anti-NDA vote. Communal violence between Vanniyars and Dalits is common in this region. The BSP is expected to get a big chunk of votes from the SCST community and that will help Anbumani Ramados. At least that is the calculation. Third on our list is Tumkur. This is in Karnataka. H.D. Devagoda versus G.S. Basavaraj. Devagoda is a former prime minister. He is the JDS chief. His traditional seat has been Hassan. But this time, he has given Hassan to his grandson Prajwal Revanna. And then he made a last minute announcement. He said, Devagoda, saying that he will contest from Tumkur. But winning this one is going to be difficult, even for a former prime minister. The Congress had won the seat in 2014, and the sitting MP was not happy that his seat was given to Devagoda. He even threatened to file his nomination independently. There are several other rebel candidates against Mr. Devagoda, and his opponent is the BJP's Basavaraj, the man who lost in 2014, but he lost respectably. Basavaraj polled more than 3.5 lakh votes last time. So H.D. Devagoda will do well to not take the Tumkur battle lightly. Let's come to number four on our list. Aligarh in Uttar Pradesh, a three-cornered contest here. BJP Satish Kumar Gautam is the sitting MP. In 2014, he got as many votes as the Samajwadi Party, the BSP and the Congress put together. That's how big he won. This time, the Samajwadi Party and the BSP have joined hands and they have fielded the BSP's Ajit Balyan. Now, Aligarh, remember, is a test of the Kerana model. This seat is heavily polarized. The Congress is making it even more complicated. They have fielded a strong candidate, former Aligarh MP Bijender Singh. So this is going to split the opposition vote. Both the Congress and the Gatbandan, both these candidates are from the Jat community. So their votes are going to be divided and that will help the BJP. But their challenge is anti-incumbency, high polarization, poor infrastructure, lack of development. These are key issues in Aligarh. Aligarh could go down to the wire on the 23rd of May. And finally, on today's list, we have Nanded in Maharashtra. It falls in the Marathwada region. Ashok Chavan versus Pratap Rao Chikalikar. The Congress has held the seat since 2009. They are strong in rural Maharashtra. Ashok Chavan is the sitting MP. The constituency is big with nearly 17 lakh voters. The problems on the ground are equally big here in Nanded. This region is economically backward. It is hurt by farm distress, severe shortage of water, high levels of unemployment. Ashok Chavan should start as a favorite, but the BJP's Pratap Rao Chikalikar is expected to give him a run for his money. The BJP's campaign has been strong, and we'll have to wait and see if the campaign delivers. KYC, Know Your Candidate. Today we feature Farooq Abdullah, the patron of the National Conference, three-time Chief Minister of the State of Jammu and Kashmir, 81-year-old. He will be standing from his citadel, Srinagar, in this election as well. His record as a parliamentarian reads like this. He has an attendance of 71%, a tad lower than the average of 80%, but not so bad. He participated in just two debates, a fraction of the national average of 14. He raised only 13 questions, again, well below the national average of 85. And he did not introduce a single private member bill in his last term. His constituency has a high literacy rate, even more than already high state average. 
and it also houses a large number of homes with toilets and electricity. It's a developed area. The son of veteran statesman and the National Conference's founder, Sheikh Abdullah, Farooq Abdullah studied to become a doctor. He went on to the he went to the UK, in fact, to practice medicine. He was elected to the Lok Sabha unopposed from Srinagar back in the 1980 general election. That was his entry into politics, the first time ever contesting an election. Two years later, after his father's passing away, he became the Chief Minister of Jammu and Kashmir for the first time, 1982. The National Conference believes Srinagar to be a safe seat for Farooq Abdullah and his opponents pose no threat to him. But do bear in mind, in the 2014 general election, he lost, Farooq Abdullah lost to the People's Democratic Party or PDP candidate Tariq Hamid Kara. But in 2017, he won the by-election for the Sri Lanka parliamentary seat by defeating the PDP's Nazir Ahmad Khan. But the by-poll was marred by violence and civilian deaths. That resulted in a pathetic 7% voter turnout. Seven. This general election, Farooq Abdullah's poll planks, so to speak, are Article 35A and Section 370, like in most elections. The parts of the Indian constitution that give special powers to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. They're back in currency. They're talking about these two things again. And Abdullah Senior has put up a strong campaign against them being scrapped. The BJP says it wants to scrap them. It has promised to completely do away with 35A and 370, which, uh, which way Srinagar votes is anyone's guess. But Abdullah's first priority more than anything else would be to ensure that people come out and vote this time. Frequently asked question, who is winning Tamil Nadu? It's a very topical question because all 40 seats from Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry will vote this Thursday in the second phase. You may ask why Tamil Nadu matters. After all, national parties do not have much purchase in the state. But listen to this, apart from 2014, Tamil Nadu's 40 seats have been instrumental in government formation in New Delhi. From Vajpayee's NDA government in 1998 to UPA 1 and UPA 2, Tamil Nadu held the key. In 2014, the BJP secured a majority, hence the 37 seats with the AIDMK did not matter. Else, Jay Lalitha would have been kingmaker in the last election. This time, the election in Tamil Nadu is unlike any other. What are the key issues and who has the upper hand? Let's discuss. For the Tamil Nadu voter, anti-incumbency is a major issue. So is alliance arithmetic. A strong alliance generally wins. This time, the question is, what is a strong alliance in Tamil Nadu? Traditionally, DMK, Congress, Left, MDMK, Dalit Panther should be enough to bag an easy win. But AIDMK has PMK in its alliance, and that will bring the NDA some votes in northern Tamil Nadu. Besides, Vijay Khan's party may help because before the 2014 election, Vijay Khan's DMDK had a sizable vote share in Tamil Nadu. But DMK and AIDMK remain the dominant parties in the state, and they are both in unchartered territory. They've never contested an election like this. Both parties have lost their primary vote pullers, their supreme leaders, Karunanidhi in the case of DMK and Jailalitha in the case of AIDMK. Though MK Stalin of the DMK is an experienced politician, he does not have the aura or the oratorical skills of his father, Karunanidhi. For the AIDMK, it's a test of survival. Shashikala's nephew, TTV Dinakaran, has his own party. That could hurt the AIDMK. Plus, there's anti-incumbency against the EPS OPS government in the state. From the jelly cut to protest to the sterlite agitation, Tamil Nadu has been in protest mode since Jailalitha's death. The other thing is this: any party, and this is interesting, any party that contested elections along with the BJP has lost in the state. In 2001, the DMK was in the NDA, a partner of the BJP. In the assembly elections, they were completely routed. In 2004, the AIDMK was in the NDA. They lost on all the 40 seats in the Lok Sabha election. And since then, these two Dravidian parties have kept away from the BJP until now. The AIDMK this time has partnered with the BJP. They're unlikely to keep all the 37 seats that they won in 2014. And that's an understatement. The AIDMK may be staring at a debacle this time. They will hope that the MGR Jailalitha loyalist votes will stay intact and they hope to add the one year votes, the DMDK votes and the upper caste votes. But such a scenario is possible, not probable. And that's not all. The presence of new parties like the Naam Tamiliar, that's US Us Tamils and Kamal Hassan's MNM have muddied the electoral waters. They will split votes. Nobody knows which way those votes will go. 
The DMK Congress combine is hoping for a revival. The alliance is held through testing times. They also managed to get the left and the Dalit Panthers in their fold. But this should worry them. The Congress has been given nine seats in Tamil Nadu and one in Pondicherry, 10 in all, out of 40. And that's too many seats for a party whose vote share is abysmally low in this region. A victory for the Congress in most of these seats will be a miracle. Similarly, the left parties have got four seats. Again, more than what they deserve. The DMK is contesting on 20, and it is, it is likely to win most of these. The other factor is money. Bribing voters is the accepted election formula in the state of Tamil Nadu. All sides do it. And as we speak, the election in Vellore constituency has been cancelled. The reason is simple. The poll panel had earlier suspected the use of money to influence voters and they sent a letter to the president to scrap this election. The DMK is crying foul, but this could be the first of many actions from the election commission. Expect a lot more action in the next 24 hours. As far as issues go, Tamil Nadu is riddled with problems. A decade ago, the state dominated most social indicators. Now it struggles. Alcoholism has hurt. The government's TASMAC is a major source of revenue. Tamil Nadu was once a strong agricultural and industrial state. Today, it suffers acute water shortage, farm distress, rising unemployment, and environmental issues. The Chennai floods expose the holes in the city planning. Anti-sterlite protests and the shutdown of textile mills, the firecracker industry, they're all just examples of the sorry state that Tamil Nadu finds itself in. And all this could work in the UPA's favor. But if the UPA does not win, more than 25 of these 40 seats, they are in trouble. The NDA is hoping to win in Tamil Nadu what it loses in the Hindi heartland. And that is why the battle for Tamil Nadu is very crucial. Did you know, can a foreigner campaign in India's election? Why is this a relevant question? Because it's happening. A Bangladeshi actor, Firdos Ahmed, is campaigning for the Trinamool Congress Party in Kolkata. The Ministry of Home Affairs has sought a report from the Foreign Regional Registration Office. The Bangladesh government has since asked Firdos Ahmed to return to Dhaka and now the FFRO notice has also come. The BJP went to the election commission. They said the participation of a foreign national is in violation of the model code of conduct. Is it? That is the question. Can foreigners participate in an Indian election campaign? The short answer is yes, they can. The Election Commission's rule book does not prevent foreign nationals from taking part in election campaigns, but understand the nuance here. The rule book has no rule on the matter. It says nothing about the participation of foreigners. Now, foreign nationals in poll campaigns are becoming a bit of a trend, not just in India, but around the world. Ahead of the US presidential campaign, remember in 2016, British leaders Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage made positive comments on Donald Trump. Some leaders even visited America. It is allowed in the US, but India's electoral law remains mute on this front. Two years ago, the law ministry posed a question to the poll panel. The question was this, can people of Indian origin, PIOs, campaign in Lok Sabha and Assembly elections in India? Do such campaigns violate visa conditions? This was because several people of Indian origin were campaigning in the Punjab Assembly election. The Chief Electoral Officer of Punjab asked the Commission if such people can be allowed. Now this issue only concerns PIOs, people of Indian origin. The Law Ministry and the Election Commission are yet to decide. Should they be allowed? Remember, PIOs are not Indian citizens. They're people of Indian origin only. They visit India on a visa. They explain the purpose of the visit in their visa application. How is it right to allow such people who have not mentioned election campaign as a reason for a visit to influence India's elections? And what about foreign nationals like Firdaus Ahmed? Did she indicate her, in her visa that she will campaign for Mamata Banerjee? Should such campaigns be allowed? After all, these foreigners have nothing at stake in India's election. Should their political views matter to the voter? These questions are very important because increasingly there is talk of foreign influence in elections. Across the world, several countries have passed legislations to, bring, to not bring up foreign policy issues before voters. And governments around the world are looking for tacit support from outsiders to retain power. Just last week, Benjamin Netanyahu won the Israel election and during his campaign, Donald Trump had endorsed him, had acknowledged Israel's sovereignty of Golan Heights and most agree that this helped Netanyahu win. 
If India's election commission remains silent, such events will happen here as well. Foreign campaigners, foreign powers will try to influence the voter for their vested interest. It's an issue that needs the election commission's urgent attention. On that note, it's a wrap on this edition of India Election Watch. Do keep your comments coming in. You can tweet us with the hashtag India Election Watch. We'll see you same time, same place tomorrow. Thanks for watching.